third party another object from the perspective of those two frames and thinking about the velocity of that object as perceived in the two frames. We'll also learn how to properly add velocities of objects to frame velocities in special relativity. Let's use a concrete example to motivate a kind of basic problem we can use going forward to think about the question of object velocities relative to moving frames of reference. So the example I will pick for this is a <clears throat> non-copyright violating space wars. Recently in a globular cluster fairly nearby, two ships were engaged in a chase. The lead ship is moving away from the pursuing ship at a velocity given by the vector v. The pursuing ship fires a projectile straight at the lead ship along the line of motion and at a velocity vector u relative to the firing ship. With what velocity does the lead ship observe the projectile to move? Now I've illustrated this with a little graphic cartoon right here. We have the pursuing ship on the left the projectile it's fired with the velocity of the projectile from its perspective drawn here in red, the ship it's pursuing over here on the right, and the velocity of that ship being pursued relative to the, the pursuing ship given by the vector v. Now, in the Galilean or Newtonian view of space and time, the answer to the question, with what velocity does the lead ship observe the projectile to move, is rather straightforward. The observed velocity in its frame of reference, u vector prime, would be equal to the velocity of that ship with respect to the pursuing ship minus the velocity of the projectile with respect to the pursuing ship. That would also turn out to be completely wrong when the velocities in this question approach velocities near that of light. So, for instance, if the projectile is actually a beam of light, imagine a laser beam, a laser cannon mounted on the front of the pursuing ship, it turns on the cannon, the beam is emitted, this is a beam of pure light, it should move at the speed of light. If we plug that into this calculation, we get all kinds of wrong answers here. The lead ship doesn't, sh doesn't see the laser beam approaching at the speed of light, and we know that's just not consistent with observation as encoded in the postulates of special relativity. So what then is the correct addition of velocities in a problem like this? And that's the question we want to figure out in this lecture. We can begin by writing down the Lorentz transformation equations, treating the pursuing ship as the rest frame, the lead ship as the moving frame, and the projectile as an object to be located or studied in either frame. The space-time coordinates of that object in each frame are given as follows. For example, if we have the space-time coordinates x and t in the rest frame, we can get the space-time coordinates in the moving frame, the s prime frame, using this version of the Lorentz transformation equations yielding x prime and t prime, the location and the time at which the location is observed for the projectile in the perspective of the lead ship. Now, we can write differentials of space and time using calculus, dx prime and dt prime, and this will allow us to work toward obtaining equations with velocities. So for instance, u prime is the first derivative of x prime with respect to t prime. After all, that would be the velocity of the object as observed in the lead ship or moving frame. u would be the first derivative of x with respect to t. That's the perspective of the projectile's velocity from the rest frame or the pursuing ship. Now, if this particular step feels weirdly familiar to you, in an earlier lecture, I walked you through a brief example as to why the Lorentz transformation needs to be a linear transformation between moving frame coordinates and rest frame coordinates. And we came dangerously close in that lecture to deriving the velocity transform, albeit I was doing that for arbitrary powers x to the n and t to the m, for instance.
Here, of course, it's purely linear because it's based on the Lorenz transformation. And so if some of this feels awkwardly familiar, you may flip back to the earlier lecture on the Lorenz transformation and have a look and see where the roots of this were planted. So the differential of space in the moving frame dx prime is going to be equal to gamma times the quantity dx minus v dt. And the differential of time in the moving frame is going to be equal to gamma times the quantity negative v over c squared dx plus dt. Now we can take the ratio of dx prime over dt prime and this allows us to get the velocity u prime of the projectile as observed in the moving frame or the frame of the lead ship. Substituting in with our differentials for dx prime and dt prime we arrive at this rather unpleasant looking equation but one of the nice things about this is that the leading gamma factors the 1 over square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared terms they cancel out in both the numerator and the denominator and this leaves us with an equation that looks like this just in terms of the remaining differentials of dx and dt now if we divide the top and the bottom by dt the little unit of time that we're considering then we wind up with terms that go like dx over dt, which is just u, the velocity of the projectile, in this case entirely along the x-axis. And so this equation takes the following form, which at the end of things doesn't look horrible. The velocity of the projectile, as observed in the moving frame, the frame of the lead ship, is simply given by the velocity of the projectile as launched from the perspective of the rest frame, the pursuing ship, minus the velocity of the frame, so the velocity difference between the lead ship and the pursuing ship, divided by a quantity that goes like the motion, 1 minus uv over c squared. So we have arrived at a formula for combining the velocities of the moving frame with the velocity of the projectile as observed in the rest frame to allow us to compute the observed velocity of the projectile in the moving frame. This equation is a substitution for the old Galilean transformation addition of velocities equation and is correct from the perspective of special relativity. So let's plug in some numbers and see what we learn about projectile motion in the case where objects are also in relative motion to each other and observing that projectile as it moves. And let's begin by picking a low velocity situation where the ships are not really moving apart from each other all that fast. I've decided to pick the lead ship having a velocity of just 1% the speed of light or 0.01c. And I've picked a projectile velocity that's just three times bigger than that or 3% the speed of light. 0.03c from the perspective of the firing ship, the pursuing ship. Now from the above equation we learn that the lead ship observes the projectile approaching it at a speed of 0.02c. Now if you stare at this for a moment and recall the Galilean velocity transformation you'll note that this is exactly what we would have expected from the low speed case where all the velocities of objects in the problem are, are not really a large fraction of the speed of light, although I've allowed them in this case to go up to a few percent the speed of light. We actually get back exactly what would have been told to us by the velocity transformation in Newtonian slash Galilean relativity, that is that u prime equals u minus v. Now that doesn't mean that this is exactly true at every decimal place. There's some decimal place where the Newtonian Galilean approximation uh, to space and time and motion breaks down compared to the more accurate special relativistic calculation. So let's instead pick some bigger velocities. Let's now assume that the lead ship is racing away from the pursuing ship at half the speed of light. And then from the perspective of the pursuing ship, it fires this projectile at 8 tenths the speed of light, 0.8c. Plugging those numbers in, we find out that the lead ship observes the projectile to approach it at one half the speed of light. And if you stare at that again for a moment, play around with the numbers on your own, you'll very quickly realize that this is definitely not what would have been predicted by the Newtonian or Galilean approach. It's not simply u minus v in this case.
Now, interestingly, we can look at the case of when the lead ship is flying toward the pursuer. So now we turn the lead ship around and we aim it back at the pursuing ship and flip its velocity vector so that it's moving at negative 0.5c from, compared to its original direction of motion. In that case, we see that the lead ship that's now racing toward the projectile that's been fired at it doesn't observe that projectile to be moving in excess of the speed of light. Rather, it observes it to be moving at 93% the speed of light. And that's, again, a distinction from what the Newtonian or Galilean approach would have yielded. The old relativistic approach from Galilean relativity would have predicted that the lead ship observes the projectile to be approaching at a speed that is far in excess of the speed of light. But we also know from the postulates of special relativity that one consequence is that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. And so we see that that's preserved here in the velocity transformation. Although the velocity of the ship is now aimed back at its pursuer, and although the naive addition of velocities would give you something in excess of the speed of light, the naive addition is not consistent with observations of space and time and the speed of light. And using the special relativistic transformation, we see that while it's true that the velocity of the projectile does appear to be larger than when the lead ship was racing away from it, it does not exceed the speed of light, but comes in at a pretty, pretty fair fraction of the speed of light. So let's summarize what we've learned about adding velocities in special relativity, keeping in mind that the cases that I've built these equations from all involved an object velocity that was parallel or anti-parallel to the velocity of the frames. If you have the velocity of the object in the rest frame and want to determine it in the moving frame, then the left equation is what you want. If on the other hand you have the object velocity in the moving frame and you want to determine it in the rest frame, all that should change between the left equation and its corresponding equation on the right should be that you swap u and u prime and you flip the sign of all terms that involve v or v cubed or something like that. You take v and send it to negative v. And in fact that's the equation that's written here on the right. You can always derive these directly from the Lorentz transformation or you can memorize one of them and remember how to transform it into the other by swapping the object velocities and flipping the sign of the frame velocities. I'll leave it up to you as to what your best possible learning strategy is for this, but know that if you memorize one of these, you can figure out the other from context and knowing how to trade the mathematics around. Now, what if the object, instead of having its velocity aligned parallel or anti-parallel to the frame velocities, is moving in a direction that isn't solely parallel or anti-parallel to V? So, you might be tempted to assume that the object velocity in, for instance, the y direction, assuming that the frames are moving only along the x and x prime axes, you might be tempted to assume that the object velocity along the y direction and the z direction, as observed in either frame, is the same. Since in the Lorentz transformation, coordinates y and y prime, z and z prime, are equal to each other if all the motion is along x and x prime. And you'd be wrong. You need to be very careful with these things. Why? Well, think about it a second. Object velocity necessarily involves the time derivative of a coordinate. Is time absolute between two different frames of reference? Well, we should feel pretty confident at this point that the answer is that it does not. T does not equal T prime in special relativity. Because a time derivative is involved, there's going to be a dy dt, and there's going to be a dy prime dt prime. And while y may be equal to y prime, t is not equal to t prime. So let's go through this. I'm going to consider motion component along the y-axis. The frames are moving entirely along x. So V in this is still directed entirely along the X and X prime axes. But I'm going to allow the velocity of the object to develop a component UY or UY prime along the Y and Y prime axes respectively. 
So let's look at what the transformation of u prime to u would be for the case of this component along the y axis and y prime axis. So we know that in the rest frame, u subscript y is just dy dt. It's the change in the y coordinate with respect to time as observed in the rest frame. Now it's true that in the Lorenz transformation, if the motion is entirely along x and x prime, that y does equal y prime. So we can replace dy with dy prime, and no harm, no foul. That's mathematically allowed. But if we're going to substitute for dt with dt prime, we have to use the full glory of the differential form of the time equation in the Lorenz transformation. And that means replacing dt with the quantity I show here in the denominator of this fraction. Now, of course, I can divide the top and the bottom by dt so that I get a ui prime in the numerator and the denominator. Gammas don't cancel out in this case, though, between the numerator and the denominator because y equals y prime y and y prime don't depend on a gamma factor to correct between them. And as a result, it's actually an easier derivation, I feel, than for the case of the object motion component along the direction of travel of the, the frame relative to the rest frame. Um, but it, it's not perhaps quite as uh, memorable looking. Now, similarly, if we have ui prime and want ui, all we have to do is swap ui prime and ui in these equations and replace v with minus v. And so the corresponding equation that tells us what the velocity component in the moving frame looks like, given the velocity component in the rest frame, uh, will be the one I show here. And by the way, if there's a component of motion along z and z prime, you can obtain a similar equation. It has pretty much exactly the same form as the one shown here with uy replaced by uz and uy prime replaced by uz prime. Um, you can very quickly write that equation down. But I just want to go through this because it's important to recognize that while it's true that y equals y prime and z equals z prime when the motion is entirely along x and x prime, it is not true that uy is naively equal to uy prime. And that's because a time derivative is involved. And time does not pass the same way in the two frames when one is moving relative to the other. Finally, let's take a look at one last special case. And that is if the pursuing ship shoots a laser beam at the lead ship. So what I've done is I've replaced the red projectile with a red squiggly line to represent an electromagnetic wave, light, being fired at the lead ship. Now the lead ship is still moving at a velocity v vector with respect to the pursuing ship. I've put everything along the horizontal axis here. But now the velocity of the projectile is c because this is a beam of light and so it will always and forever move at exactly the speed of light so the speed of this per projectile is now exactly 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second as viewed from all frames so if the pursuing ship had fired a weapon like this a laser beam a beam of light well, we know that the second postulate of special relativity demands that all observers must see light moving at C regardless of their state of motion. So does this velocity addition relationship capture that postulate in all of its full glory? Well, let's find out. Let's assume that the relative velocity of the lead ship to the pursuing ship is one half C and that the projectile speed, as viewed in the rest frame of the pursuing ship, is c, the speed of light. Well, plugging these numbers in, uh, we can start from the equation where we have the relative velocity of the two frames and the speed of the projectile in the rest frame, and we can get the speed of the projectile as observed in the moving frame. So all I've done is I've replaced u in this equation with c, because the projectile is a, speed of, is a beam of light that's moving at the speed of light. If you do some algebra, you can simplify this equation to c minus v all over the quantity 1 minus v over c. And if you do a little bit more algebra, you'll find out that this is just equal to c minus v over the quantity 1 over c times c minus v. And if you play with this one step further, you find out that this is just equal to c, the speed of light. So in fact, we see that v entirely drops out of this equation once the projectile is a light beam. The value of v doesn't matter at all. The relative velocity between these two vessels can be any number 
and it won't affect the outcome of the calculation. V could have been a, a half C or negative a half C or 0.8 C or 0.99999 C. Basically, once U equals C, V drops entirely out of the equation and we always recover that U prime equals C as well. The second postulate of special relativity is fully obeyed by this velocity transformation equation. So to review, in this lecture, we have learned how to think about object velocities in different frames of reference and how to go from the coordinates of an object that's in motion to its velocity in different frames. We've then used that information to figure out how to properly add velocities of objects to frame velocities in special relativity. We've looked at a couple of case studies of this and seen that everything seems to comport with the postulates of special relativity which themselves comport with observations of the natural world.